we'll introduce you to shortly. Um, but of course, there will be an opportunity to ask some questions as we go through the session. What we'd ask is that if you could type in the chat function to, to get those questions through. So if you start your questions with the text question in caps locks, uh, put that through and then my colleagues kindly are going to collate those, send those to me and then we'll go through those for about 15 minutes or as much time as we have at the end of the session um, to do that. Um, just some general points as well on housekeeping. Um, please do keep yourself on mute for the session unless we mention otherwise. Um, captions are available as well, so you'll find those at um, the bottom of your screen. Just um, an occupational hazard of Zoom, and I'm, I'm sure people are aware of it, is that if you have joined with a mobile phone, sometimes your number can come up on the screen as well. So um, if there's any issues there, we'd like to, to make sure that's not seen, you might want to change your name as well. Um, I'm pleased to say that we will be recording this session as well, which is great, so it will be available afterwards. But that does mean there may be um, the odd photo as well. Um, so if anyone's uncomfortable with any of that, probably best just to turn off um, your camera now. Um, if you have any technical problems as well or any concerns around safeguarding or feeling uncomfortable at any time, please just message Diana in the chat box and she'll be able to help you out with any issues as we go through. Um, the session will best work if you use SpeakerView um, and you can change your view in the top right of the screen to do that. So I think that's most of um, the housekeeping, I'm, I'm pleased to say. I think we'll, we'll get going with our recording now and, and crack into the session. So good afternoon again, everyone. My name is Charles Sainsbury. I work as the Eden Project's Energy and Sustainability Manager. Um, I support our teams both here in Cornwall, as you can see the lovely biomes are behind me, and also internationally further afield with projects um, such as our geothermal um, energy plant, helping our teams rolling out electric vehicle infrastructure and supporting our operations teams with energy management and recycling initiatives. Um, regenerative sustainability really is at the heart of everything that the Eden Project does. We've long championed the importance of radical climate action to tackle the climate emergency. So it really is a privilege um, and an honor for me to be hosting this session today. Um, anyway, you've not come to hear from me. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to um, our fantastic panelists, who I'm sure you're as keen to hear from as I am. Um, and so I'll now pass over to them to, to get them to tell you a little bit about themselves, the organization they work for, um, and what it is they do. So if it's okay, um, I'll start with you, Myros. Oh, I hate going first. Thank you so much for asking me to do this event. I'm really excited about the sheer range of things that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so I'm Maya Rose Craig, I'm 18, and I uh, run an organisation called Black to Nature, uh, which basically is all about tackling the inequality within the types of people who are able to access the countryside and uh, spend time in green spaces and with nature, but also within the environmental movement and making sure that everyone's voices are being heard as we're trying to build back this better future, I suppose. Um, so I've been, sorry, I'll be very quick. Uh, I've been running this project for about five years now. And um, it's, I think it's been a very interesting journey where I think we're in a very um, transitional period for the environmental movement, for people who care about the environment at the moment. Mm -hmm. In that um, I feel like we're in a period where there's so much opportunity for change and so much opportunity to build this better world that we're trying to work towards. Um, and that makes me very excited. And that's why I'm quite excited for this session today as well. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Maya Rose. Noga? Hiya. Um, I'm Noga Ledrathcourt. I'm a volunteer and organiser for the UK Student Climate Network. Um, and we've been responsible for organising kind of the climate strikes across the UK for the past two, well, for all of 2019, the start of 2020 before COVID hit. Um, as part of the global youth strike for climate campaign under Fridays for Future. Um, amongst other events and rallies, we organized the global climate strike um, last year, which was the largest climate mobilization that ever took place in the UK. Um, and we're campaigning not just to decolonize and reshape the education system to accommodate for the political and environmental ramifications of the climate crisis, but also to enfranchise and to empower young people. Um, and most importantly, we are campaigning for a Green New Deal, which will centre a just transition for those on the front lines of the 
ecological catastrophe really and one that will directly tackle the structural inequalities that brought about the climate emergency and focusing really on the UK's fair share of fighting the climate crisis and our historical responsibility in the battle for climate justice. Lovely, thank you Nova. I move on to Mark. Hi, thanks Charles. Good morning everybody. Um, yeah, I'm also delighted to be here today, but particularly um, impressed by the two previous speakers who um, have achieved so much um, so young. I mean, I was an activist from a very early age, but, um, but, but what they've achieved and continue to achieve is, is highly inspiring. Um, I'm here today uh, for the Climate Reality Project, um, which as many people uh, will know was formed by a former US Vice President Al Gore. Um, his aim really being to train a, a network of people who would uh, take back to their communities the science around climate change and to catalyze action uh, both in terms of raising awareness of the problems and the solutions but also in encouraging people to demand action from their leaders in line with the science it's always been that from the beginning it's always been about let's act on what the science um, is telling us there's now around 30,000 I believe climate leaders um, that have gone through the training program uh, more than 500 of those are are here in the UK and we're working by not just delivering presentations although sadly it's still necessary in some areas to um, to raise awareness of the uh, the nature of the climate crisis but also the severity of it and the urgency of it which I still think isn't necessarily understood even by those people now who perhaps are more aware of it so we're certainly working in that area I'm also working with um, other groups on demanding councils and other bodies declare climate emergencies and then trying to work with them to facilitate the actions that they might take in response from that um, as I said I've been an activist um, from a very early age um, and have um, been active in the climate uh, sphere for perhaps 15, maybe 20 years now. Um, I trained myself as a climate leader um, in 2013, and I've been the UK volunteer coordinator uh, for just over a year now. So that's me. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. And last but not least, Anna. Hi there, um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. My name's Anna Heslop. I'm the Head of Wildlife and Protected Areas at Client Earth. We are a legal environmental charity, um, so we're mostly lawyers. Um, we bring legal interventions, so cases and helping to draft legislation and um, making sure that laws are, uh, proper laws are put in place and then enforced all over the world um, to try to protect the environment and human health. Um, so we do a lot on climate change and we do a lot on bio biodiversity and we're more and more seeing those two things as, as sort of one huge environmental uh, crisis. So it's great to be here today to talk about how we find some of the solutions to that. Well, thank you all very much for those amazing introductions. Really exciting to have you today. So, so let's get cracking. Um, and thinking about 2020 and whichever walk of life you're from, it's been quite a year, hasn't it? Um, at the start of the year, we saw raging bushfires in Australia. We've seen Arctic sea ice reduce to almost its lowest level. Um, atmospheric levels of CO2 are at their highest levels. Probably 2020 will be the warmest year on record. And to top it all off, we're still in the midst of a global pandemic caused by the COVID-19 coronavirus. Now, luckily, like most of my colleagues down here at the Eden Project, we tend to be um, eternal optimists. And in the spirit of this session today, it's really thinking about how we can empower our communities to make positive changes and how they can emerge positively um, out of this crisis. COVID-19 has been awful for many, I think. But perversely, I think we need, really now have this crucial opportunity to think about the way we want to move forwards, as our panelists have alluded to, that we can't carry on as we did before. We can't keep on encroaching on nature and we need to put the climate and ecological emergencies at the heart of our recovery. So thinking about this theme, I think it's time to bring in our panelists um, for their thoughts on our first question, if I could. So first question to, to all panelists is how much of an impact do you believe the COVID crisis has had um, in relation to the climate emergency? And in particular, what lessons do you think we can learn as we come out of the pandemic regards to environmental protection? Um, and volunteers to go first would be lovely. Yeah, I think, um, I suppose this cross section between Corona and the environment is quite difficult to talk about without sounding very, 
I suppose almost like an environmentalist that doesn't care about the other things, which isn't true at all. Um, but for me personally, I feel like this year has been a real tragedy in terms of environmentalism and the climate change movement in that I felt like there was for the first time in forever really, there was suddenly a real momentum behind these environmental movements. Like people were finally starting to listen. It was finally really the biggest issue on the agenda. And for me personally, I, I absolutely understand why it's been sidelined this year, but personally it feels more like it's been used and the pandemic has been used by an excuse as an excuse by many people in power mm -hmm. where it's suddenly like oh there's an issue we don't have to talk about climate change anymore because I think there's an absolute lack of desire from people in power to deal with all of the various environmental crises that we're coping with at the moment because in my opinion at least not to sound very cynical but I think it does come down to um, money versus the environment and money at the moment is always going to be prioritized um, I'd love to hear what other people have to say, though. Absolutely. Thanks, Myra. So I'm, I'm going to be slightly more optimistic than that. I, I hear exactly what Maya is saying, and I think that COVID has been sort of all consuming this year. But um, I do think there's also been a sort of an adjustment during this crisis where people have realised that actually they can live differently. Now, I'm not saying that any of us want to live in a world where we have to stay in our houses all the time and we can't see and hug people. But I think people have felt more connected to nature and they've realised that their cities are much nicer when they can cycle around them and there isn't loads of traffic. And they, um, you know, they, they like that the air isn't polluted when they go outside. And so I think a lot of people have found it in some ways trying to find the silver linings they felt more connected to their environment and they've noticed those things before which they sort of hadn't previously so i hope that that will sort of make people you know move forward in a slightly different way when we come out of this crisis and i hope that when we get i know we're going to come on to talk about green recovery but i hope that when we do come out of the other side of this we're taking decisions in a slightly different context with, with that sort of feeling of actually the environment is quite important to people on a personal level. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else want to come in on that? Yes, Mark. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I think just following on a similar vein, really, I think the two things that we have seen with it is, is the first one I think would also add is uh, we now know what an emergency looks like. So there's a message there about you can put leaders of countries up in front of TVs, along with scientists and say, this is happening, here's a graph, it explains what's going on, this is why it's important we take action. So I think when people say, well, when you talk about climate emergencies, what should our leaders do? There is now a template for what that might look like. So I think there's there's one thing there. Um, I think the other thing for me is, um, as Anna said about, you know, it might not be what, what we want to live in, in terms of an environment of being in our own homes. However, again, we've also shown that we can shut down society. People have often said about the climate crisis, well, all your ideas are great, but you do realise that, you know, the economy and everything will falter and we haven't got the money for it. Well, again, we've managed to, certainly earlier in the year, shut down the economy and find money that we were told never existed, um, you know, to, to put things in place. And I think that's, again, a lesson we can take forward. I think the third thing for me is um, historically, often crises have been used to go backwards. Um, very often they're used to bring in regressive measures to say we now haven't got the money to do this. But there are other um, lessons from history and particularly the New Deal um, in the States, which is, of course, the sort of theory that sits behind the uh, the Green New Deal is that came also a, a point of terrific difficulty. And I think it shows that we have a very clear choice to make about how we come out of this. And there is a threat to going the wrong way, but there's an equal opportunity to doing things right and building back better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's really pertinent points out there. And I guess that's what I was getting at with my, my opening gambit was saying that, yes, this has been truly awful for, for many people, economies, countries, societies and our communities across the world but let's try and use this and realize that encroachment on the environment um is, is is all one and the same and effectively we need to think about the way we, we live with earth our relationship with nature how we use natural resources holistically and if this is an opportunity to do things differently then let's think about how we can do that um anna conveniently just mentioned um some points around the green recovery 
Um, and particularly this week, we've seen the Prime Minister's release of his 10 point plan, which is uh, a blueprint for a green industrial revolution and um, a, a decarbonisation of, of Britain. And I, I'm sure we could debate the level of detail um, and the level of ambition that, that's gone into it. Um, but generally, I think it seems to be being received quite positively, obviously, with much work to be done and a lot of practicalities to work through. And I just wanted to ask the panellists now. Um, if you know they had a blank canvas, what do they think um, the green recovery should look like, and what do you think some of the key opportunities um, are that, that we sh we should be looking to seize upon? Noga. I mean, I'm probably more on my razor side in, in that I'm a bit pessimistic about how this year has gone. Um, to me, coronavirus feels like such a microcosm of how all the structural inequalities that brought climate change to where it is can just implode on all of us at once. And that is a terrifying prospect. Um, but I think that what this means is that after this pandemic, we can change everything. You know, we can kind of reset the clock and build back better than before. But for that to happen, we need a recovery that can create a robust, shock-proof economy that is capable of tackling the climate crisis by tackling the inequalities that already exist by enhancing kind of the lives of ordinary people and communities by creating kind of thousands of green well-paid secure jobs across the country and investing in people ensuring that the policies and investments for recovery don't just kind of profit the and prop up the profits of the big banks and the executives of corporations that fuel climate change and inequality but we need to restructure public and private finance, that we can redistribute power into the hands of people, into workers and communities, and actually support sectors that nourish our society, that safeguard our future. I think we need to build solidarity and community across borders. We've seen the international impact of a crisis, and really with climate change, we've been seeing that for decades. And that means that anything we do now, and in the longer term recovery, has to be with the aim of ending global injustices, of ending conflict, of ending environmental degradation, and of guaranteeing human rights and freedom of movement for all in preparation for the catastrophes yet to come. Um, I think that means we have to start organizing and sharing solutions, sharing technology, transferring finance and redistributing wealth where it's needed, both from local communities to the world stage. I think we really have no other choice, otherwise we are heading towards kind of a coronavirus field collapse that could crush us all underfoot. Thanks, Togi. Yeah, those are really amazing points. Yeah, and I think the point you pick around finance is, is absolutely key as well, because so much of our, our wealth and our, our pensions, for example, are held within you know, this global finance system, which is then used to invest into different products, services and goods. But if we could have genuine green finance, which stimulates those decisions, that's, that's hugely important as well. Is there any other thoughts from the rest of the panel on that question? Mark? I'll be very quick, Anna, because I see your hand did go up as well. So um, I, mean, I just, I mean, my first thing would be to say everything Noga just said, because I just, we couldn't agree more with all of those points. That there are just a couple of quick ones I will add. I think one, the challenge to um, any sort of legislation or, or move towards um, things that have the name recovery plan on them. I think the simple test is to say, uh, does it deliver quick enough in terms of what the science is telling us we need to do? So I think there's a very, you know, often in politics you can get in terms of someone wants to go faster, someone wants to go slower. Um, and, and people want to do different things. But I think that's the test for climate action is that one. And the other thing, which again, I think threads through what, what Noga said as well, is there is a challenge to all of us to recognize that it's a systemic issue. And that systemic issue affects not just climate, but racial equality, social justice, world poverty, um, you know, the difference between nations and how we face that. And I think you have to understand that systemic problem if you're gonna put the policies in place that will address the climate crisis. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark. And moving over to Anna. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, again, not very controversial, but I'm going to agree with the other panellists. But I, I would just say on sort of on, on green recovery and green economy, the way that governments traditionally try to recover from financial issues is through subsidies and infrastructure projects. 
Now, subsidies, we know, uh, tend to be some of the biggest drivers for environmental harm. Agricultural subsidies go to the wrong places. They, they incentivize farmers to do really unhelpful things. Um, we love farmers, but unfortunately, the subsidy, um, the subsidy system at the moment doesn't help them. The UK is in a unique position in that it's withdrawing from the EU. So it really has a blank slate with how it does its subsidies going forward. Same goes for kind of fishing um, and then infrastructure projects. So governments, when they're trying to recover from an economic uh, catastrophe, will just try and just give out loads of contracts for big infrastructure projects, making sure that those infrastructure projects are green and are not. Let's just build loads more motorways. Let's just, you know, stick with the status quo is going to be absolutely key. And I think members of the public can have an influence on that by telling their politicians what they want to see and what they really don't want to see. We've got, I think, a once in a, a generation opportunity to not mess this up. <laughs> um, and it is a sort of reset because there will be so much um, sort of public money going into these, these schemes and going into these sort of subsidies. That's your money as a taxpayer and you should have a say over where it goes. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Anna. Um, I think one area that we, we've just touched on there as well is, is the issue of responsibilities as well and I think this always comes up in the climate debate when you think about how much of the burden should be shared with the individual versus potentially organizations institutions governments as well and ultimately today is about thinking about how many practical solutions we can share to help each other and I mean here at the Eden project our philosophy is that when different people ideas and interests and things come together they add up to so much more than the sum of their parts so really collectively individual actions really do add up and count. So, so what I'd like to ask our panelists, if I could, and it's, it's quite an open question, is what responsibilities um, do you think we all have as citizens going forwards to mitigate current climate change and accelerate our response to the climate emergency? And I'm looking for hands on, on the panel. <laughs> Maya Rose. Um, yeah, I think this is a really interesting question just because it's something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about myself in the I like a uh, bit environmentalism has always been a really major part of my life but when I was younger it was much more that narrative of individual change is the most important thing you have to recycle you have to cycle more all that uh, all that sort of thing and then mm -hmm. suddenly there was this big realization of like oh not every like it's okay because I'm not the most responsible person here. And I think I completely swung in the other direction because it was such a relief. And I think that's the side that people don't touch on as much, how exhausting it is to try and be the perfect environmentalist because you're never gonna be the perfect environmentalist because you, you, know, you live in a society, that's how it works. It's not good for the environment and all you can do is try your best. And so for me personally, even though I acknowledge the fact that maybe the individual decisions I make aren't the most impactful in terms of environmental issues. For me, it feels like the right decision in terms of like morality almost. Like I feel like I want to do the right thing and I want to do my bit to help. And it doesn't really matter how much of a difference or not that actually makes. Um, and I think that's also a really positive way of dealing with environmentalist fatigue burnout all those sorts of things because it's just letting yourself off the hook a bit um because i i absolutely believe that if we try and hold ourselves to incredibly high standards and beat ourselves up over everything we do um you're going to be sick of trying to save the environment within like a year or two and that's not how it works you know yeah absolutely um i, I completely agree as well and i love that point around we're not all perfect, we know all that, and, and sometimes it can feel like a bit of a, a barrage at the moment, can't it, with, with things that come through the news and, and the world we live in as well. So just trying to make those small changes as much as we can um, and holding ourselves to account where it's reasonable is, is really important. Um, any other thoughts from the rest of our panel? Anna? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. And I think there's also, you know, bringing it back to this, there is a systemic problem. I think the answers are systemic as well. So, so yes, we can all, you know, try and fly a bit less, make sure we're not using um, uh, single use plastics, all of those sorts of things that, you know, choices that we make in our everyday lives. But there are some things that we can't change. 
without politicians doing it for us because we're not in a position to change those things systemically. What we can do, we elected those politicians, right? So we can hold them to account. And so making sure that there is proper public participation in decision-making about the environment, making sure that, you know, you turn up on a Thursday night to the boring council meeting when the waste strategy is gonna be talked about and there'll only be three members of the public there. But if you're there, you'll be listened to, you know, th so sort of, um, making sure that we're doing those sorts of things could be far more effective than saying, well, I'm not going to take a straw in a restaurant when they offer me a plastic straw anymore. I mean, I would also say don't take the plastic straw, but <laughs> making sure your county's waste um, policy is, is, you know, maximizing recycling is in, arguably going to have a bigger effect. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a small thing you, you feel like you can actually make a change with, isn't it? And I, I certainly know down at Cornwall here, you can look and type in your postcode and see what the recycling rates are within your area as well. And then using that data, you've got a connection to it and actually see that your actions do count towards towards something bigger as well. Any other thoughts on that from the panel? Yes, Noga. Um, yeah, I may bounce off of that in terms of political and public participation. Um, I think that kind of our, maybe our most important responsibility is actually less on an individual level and more on a collective um, level of getting together and organising and reaching out um, to other communities and other people and collaborating with other initiatives, whether that's kind of running your own little community allotment to um, kind of organising demonstrations. I think that um, level of participation is our most important duty and responsibility um, kind of when faced with this kind of crisis. I think we have a moral duty, I think, that I really liked how my Rose phrased that, which is like, this is a question of morality. This is a question of what is the right thing to do. And I think a lot of that involves um, the moral duty of being incredibly political and ensuring your own enfranchisement and pushing for kind of others' empowerment. I think kind of the public awareness of the climate crisis that has changed so much over the last kind of two, three years is such an incredible thing. And it's something we can really seize on. It's something we can say to people, okay, now you know what's going on, now get involved and let's do something about it. And that requires, you know, putting massive pressure on, you know, our elected politicians and putting pressure on our local authorities and ensuring that we get stuff done. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Nega. Mark. Again, I'll, I'll try and be brief because all, all three have said things which um, I, I completely agree with as well. I, one of the in thing, interesting things for me is the climate reality presentations end with asking people to use their vote, use their voices and use their choices. And I think, as the others have said, that starts with the key thing, which is ultimately it's a political decision and therefore engaging with the political sphere to make change happen is, is the number one item. Using your voice, again, I think, uh, you know uh, the others have mentioned as well about you know getting involved with your community or or making sure that your voice is heard when a debate's going on locally about something that's going to happen mm -hmm. and the choices is the last one and that's always been right for me because quite often I get asked at the end of presentations what can I do as an individual and I think the choices is the last one I think as Maya Rose said I'm right up front is you know we need to do it it's not to say you ignore all of these things and there's lots of good things we can do but if we don't do the, the first two of those then actually we haven't got time to wait for everybody to become personally, environmentally um, appropriate, you know, to solve this problem. And I think that votes, voices and choices is quite a neat way of remembering the priorities that we should tackle these issues in. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Mark, as well. And that's kind of a nice segue as well, because I think we've mentioned the idea, the idea of justice, climate justice, and also social, economical and racial justice, which the COVID crisis has also acutely brought into light as well. Um, and one area I just wanted to touch on, and, and, and as Mark said at the top, it's, um, it's absolutely inspiring to have Maya Rose and Noga with us today, particularly with the work they've done at such a young age as well. And we just wanted to touch on this idea of, um, of youth as well, and particularly thinking for younger generations, how do we give the youth a voice? How do we make sure they're empowered? Because ultimately, you know, potentially you could argue coming out of a, a global recession, the opportunities for jobs, et cetera, a lesson for the younger generations, yet they have the biggest opportunity to think about shaping the world going forwards and, and making changes as well. So I, I just wanted to ask without directing too much at Noga and Myros, um, do you think, or do you feel there's, there's extra pressure on our youth today in regards to the climate crisis? 
Um, and, and how do you think we can empower younger generations to make sure they have a platform and make sure that their voice is going to be heard into the future? No, Gath. I think there is a certain amount almost of, um, of warped pressure that um, we've seen over the past couple of years, which is a lot of this rhetoric, generally from politicians and from people in power, um, that tend to use this phrase like, oh, the youth will save us, like, this is so inspiring, um, you know, you're going to change the world, and it's, well, actually, it's not our job, that's not on us at all, um, that's what we want you to do. Um, and so there is, there is a certain level of very frustrating pressure there, um, where we're almost expected to kind of solve all the world's problems, but not just yet. Um, mm. I think in terms of young people becoming incredibly empowered, I mean, young people have always been, from my viewpoint at least, at the forefront of every social justice movement. I think that's because um, we're lucky enough to be naive and we're lucky enough to be optimistic. I mean, for me, like I'm 18, so the coronavirus is like the first real massive crisis that I can that I have lived through and can pro will properly be able to remember. Um, but to me, that just kind of highlights how our naivety is a massive power. Our optimism is so key in a world that's kind of ravaged by hopelessness. We bring an energy and a hope and an excitement that you can really feel when you go to kind of youth organized demonstrations. We have the incredible advantage of digital networks that you know have never been in play before. We utilize this amazing endless archive of social media and we can share and inspire others through that. And but ultimately, I think the best and most important way in terms of empowering young people, and I think this also goes for everyone, is that like I think what needs to be ingrained in young minds from the very beginning is that young people should never feel like we have to ask permission or defer to others in order to make a change and act on what we feel is right. Mm -hmm. I think that's a belief that the actions and futures of all of us rely on, particularly when we're faced with a dire ecological emergency. I think there's never been a time where it's more imperative that kids around the world realize our own strength and take action for our planet. And that starts at home. It starts with our communities and the support networks around us. It starts with empowering people to collectively reshape our own communities. And it starts with telling young people that empathy and love for the world around them and sympathy and support for those who are most vulnerable and those who have suffered from this climate crisis is our strongest weapon that is the most important thing and that is what will get us through this crisis through reaching out kind of into that anger and that empathy that all young people are capable of feeling particularly around the climate crisis and that can push us forward and that can drive young people to really make a change thank you Noga that's really inspiring any other thoughts from the rest of the panel my rose um yeah i absolutely agree with everything you said and i think um so i've been doing a project for the past few months where i've been interviewing a lot of young environmental activists and a really common theme um and like from all over the world i mean and a really common theme is just how young a lot of them started and i don't mean like 14 i mean like being seven or eight and realizing that they have to do something and i think um what when lots of people are calling young people like inspiring and lovely things like that, what they don't realize is that it's not because the issue is important in that way, but it's because it's urgent. Like it, it, there's been so, no, not even so little, there's been pretty much zero action for decades. And it feels so absolutely urgent that young people who don't necessarily want to be, you know, bunking off of school to protest and things like that are feeling the need to go out and to try and, I suppose, shift the uh, path of the future towards a more positive direction. Um, and for me, like as someone who spent the past like seven years of my life fighting for the environment, like I think in a way that is intensely sad, but it's, I suppose it's how it is. Um, but I think as someone who sort of, I, I guess, was around for quite a long time before the Fridays for Future thing. I think it was literally one of, as, an, as a young environmentalist, one of the most exciting things that happened in, in my opinion, just because I remember the before where people weren't 
talking about environment or young people weren't at least weren't talking about environmental issues weren't maybe talking about climate change because people didn't know and suddenly there was this massive wave of young people around the world who knew and they cared and they wanted to do something to try and as you know save the world I guess um, and I think that was incredibly inspirational but I do definitely think going forward I don't want that responsibility to continue to sit on the shoulders of young people I want our politicians, our world leaders, the people in power to take responsibility and to go and actually take action. Like I've spoken and spoken and spoken for years about these sorts of issues, sorry, with people with influence. And they're always like, wow, it's amazing that young people are doing so much. And it's like, no, I'm talking to you so that you can do something. And the yeah. doing something is something that I want to see more of. Absolutely. Yeah. And so the next part of the question as well um, for me here is then we thought about what individual, what different dem demographics can do. But hopefully, and as I said, I try to be an eternal optimist. Hopefully we're starting to see this actually have an effect and some influence on governments, on institutions and legislation as well. Sort of the other area we want, want to touch on. And obviously, I'd like to have Anna to join us as well today. But, you know, some say in terms of responsibility, do we think um, current commitments go far enough? Do we think there's enough legislation in place? And, and targets to ensure that the scale of change required will be met. And, and for example, the UK target, we're targeting um, our climate change to be net zero by 2050. Do we think um, the current targets are ambitious enough? And if not, is, is there any ideas from the panel on, on what we think we might need to do more in those areas? Mark. Um, thanks for that. I will just I'll just finish off from the previous um, conversation as well, because I think there's an important piece. Um, uh, really, I think certainly uh, Maya Rose and Noga, right, and I've certainly had this when I've done presentations, certainly at universities and things, you're absolutely right to point the finger back at us and say, you know, you, you're the generation who've, who've got the responsibility to do something about this. Um, and I think you're also right to tell us when that sort of um, that encouragement it actually strays into being patronizing. Um, and you, you know, you're right to hold up us and others who, who do that every time. Um, but I think I, I would say why it's inspiring is even now I would say, and it's great there's so many youth activists, but even now I can still find myself on occasions the youngest person at a number of meetings on environmentalism. Um, and, and I think that's why it's great to see that there's, you know, and one of the many reasons why it's great to see uh, younger people joining this. And I, and I also think that, you know, that the, the, the Fridays for Future movement for me is the most positive one that's come out of this because there is nothing more powerful than you being inconvenient and particularly um, for all of, of some of the actions of some of the other groups in Extinction Rebellion, which, you know, have really brought the issue to the fore, removing yourselves from school or from work and refusing to participate in something is the one thing that really will make governments and people sit up and, and take notice. Um, so anyway, but on to, on to your specific questions. I think that the, the thing is, is we know 2050 is too late. Um, and what we often don't look at is that, that that date relies on the fact that the second half of the century will then require um, a sustained period of negative emissions. And, and we just don't have the land, um, you know, to, to reforest everywhere and regenerate everywhere and grow all the seagrass. And, and, and re it relies on technology, which is, which is yet unproven. So I think that, that you know, the simple measure is, is that the, the things we should be looking at should be focused on moving towards achieving a net zero scenario by 2030 um, and we've know we know we've got the answers now I mean the Centre for Alternative Technology in Wales have been publishing reports for um, probably nearly a decade now that shows we can achieve things with known technology and no nuclear and um, they've proven it in terms of the number of times that the or the amount of time the wind blows and the sun shines that you know it's physically possible to to move to that so I think we need to look at these um, templates and, and put them in place. And as we've touched on already, I mean, Noga's described it in detail. Uh, the Green New Deal is one element that, that takes us there. And I think the current um, climate and ecological emergency bill as well is another one that basically points out that, you know, we need to have, um, you know, legislation in place that says it needs to be linked to the science. So I think, again, it's that sort of having a, an overriding objective that says this isn't just about something we might want to spend a bit more money or not, but actually testing it against what the science tells us we need to do and, and move on that speed. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark. Uh, just going to pass over to Anna. I can see her hand up. 
Yeah, so um, I think it's it's clear that there's no such thing as enough, doing enough, right? <laughs> because I think I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm a lawyer. So I, 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 take my, I take my cues from people who have far, far more expertise than me. But my understanding is that if we don't fix the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis in the next 10 years, it's going to be too late. So we need to start moving. And that partly means legislating, but legislating can take time. And sometimes you don't get the best outcomes out of the legislation or you end up negotiating it for two years and what you get is watered down and blah 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 but let's make sure we get good legislation in place it's also about enforcing laws that we already have and that's not just the sort of environmental laws those are really really important but actually also finding creative ways to use other laws so at client earth we use things like finance law we use um you know directors duties of companies and stuff like that to try to make sure that we're doing this at a faster pace because um you know if we just stick with with the sort of old status quo we're not going to get there fast enough and and you know we we talk about things like the paris climate accord which is amazing we're about to we were supposed to have um a sort of biodiversity uh international conference which would have happened last month it's now been postponed for at least a year those sorts of things although they have a huge impact they're really really important at international level and they're really important that we sort of raise the issues and raise the profile and make sure that politicians are paying attention that they take time and in the meantime we need to be using every tool that we've got to make sure that we're moving things forward while we get that legislation in place so it's not just about legislation i think completely agree as well thank you anna um unless anyone else has got any comments on that in the panel i just conscious of time i wish we had more time i really do um but we've got about 15 minutes left so there's a couple of bits to touch on and also questions which i can see pouring in from the audience, which is great. Um, just one area we wanted to spend um, a brief amount of time on, which was sort of moving away from the, the detailed uh, climate change debate and thinking about this year, and particularly the amount of time that people are spending at home, the amount of doom and gloom news we're having to put up with. And that's this this issue of, of mental well-being. And I think it's amazingly encouraged to see so many people talking about it more openly than they did before the crisis. Again, if that's a positive that comes out of it, then I think that's good. Um, and, and also the fact that particularly with, with COVID-19, probably as an unintended consequence, the impacts on um, well-being and mental health are probably going to far outlive those on physical health. So really important to think about how we look after the mental health um, of our friends, our colleagues, our communities as well. So, so a nice question for the panel, I think, is what advice would you give to individuals in managing their mental health um, during the impacts of a crisis, be it COVID or climate change? And how can we try and avoid hopelessness in the face of tough headlines and, and look after each other? Um, so I'd love to hear what the panel might, might think about that. Noga. Um, the first thing I would say is that I think in our current society, we are wired to see productivity as like equivalent to our self-worth. And when your mental health is terrible and when you're unable to do any work, whether that's, you know, your actual work or um, environmentalism, it has such a big impact on your mental health. You're faced with this massive crisis and you think, oh, I'm not, and I'm not even doing anything about it. You know, what use am I? And the crisis is so terrifying on top of that. I think the most important thing I would say is that actually this responsibility is not all on your shoulders. You're like with my Rose was saying earlier, you can't be the perfect environmentalist. You can't actually be the perfect individual. Mm -hmm. You still live in a, you're, you're living in a society that you're trying to change. Of course, it's going to be tough. That means you have to take breaks sometimes. You have to build a supportive framework and network around you and work with people that understand that perspective and who are probably going through the same thing. And you're probably equally terrified and equally burnt out. And you have to ensure there are processes for your own welfare and your own well-being around you to make sure that you actually don't burst, burn out, that you don't kind of collapse from the exhaustion of it all. You are taking breaks and allowing yourself to breathe because you're trying to change something that is so huge that any like any vision of a safe and more equitable future that we have that exists beyond the climate crisis is constantly shot down as a utopia or as a paradise because that's how difficult it is to overcome this and I think accepting that is really important allowing yourself to say yeah this is a really hard job this is a terrifying crisis 
I have to take a break for myself. Absolutely. Thank you, Naga. Anna. Yeah, I think I, I think all of that is absolutely right. And I also think that there are some positive stories out there, environmental stories out there as well. We are getting progress on some of these things. I think sometimes we we so concentrate on all of the terrible stuff that we we tend not to notice that there are some victories. You know, um, uh, companies disinvesting from uh, uh, fossil fuels, governments promising that they will phase out diesel cars in the next ten years, things like that. This is a this is a gorge in Bulgaria. I'm not in this lovely place, by the way, I'm in Brussels, but this is a gorge in Bulgaria where we've managed to stop 300 million euros of EU money from paying to put a motorway through the middle of it. You know, there are some positive things happening out there in the environment. And I think also one of the things that I've been doing with my team is every week on a Monday, I send them a, a lovely little clip of a you know, some seals or some lovely birds migrating or an Arctic fox looking for a rabbit or something. <laughs> and just that, you know, immersing yourself in some nature, even if you can't go outside, actually does help your well-being and help you to feel a bit more positive and think, oh, you know what, this is, you know, it's worth fighting for. And actually, we can have some wins. Yeah, completely. Thanks, Anna. Um, just conscious of time, it's sort of just over 10 minutes left. And I, I want to get through some of the really great questions we've had coming in. Um, final thoughts on that question, though, for anyone else on the panel, if they'd like. Otherwise, um, we will move on. So questions, lots of questions which have come in, which is great. So, so thanks, everyone, for those. One question um, was from my colleague, which actually leads quite nicely to sort of our, our last question to the panel, which is I'm going to treat as, as a quick fire question to everybody. The question is, do you think COVID-19 has been a fire drill for stuff that is coming? And if so, what can I do about it at a local or individual level? And um, we have touched on that throughout the discussion today. But um, question for all panelists. Um, so we'll, we'll take this one in turns. And a, a quick fire question is, what are your top two tips um, for taking individual action to combat climate change? Uh, both here at home and in um, your, the wider community. So top two tips from each panelist would be amazing. Shall we start with Anna as we, as I was last to introduce you. So we'll start with you, Anna, if that's okay. Yes, okay. So uh, a quick thinking on my feet. Um, for me, it's all about um, public participation. It's um, make sure you're holding your politicians to account. Make sure you're you're talking about your, your worries. You're not just sort of sitting at home worrying about them. Make sure you're holding people to account and make sure you're writing to your MP. Um, yeah, be active. Thank you. Noga. I would probably go along the similar line. I would say get organizing and there will there's always going to be a group or a person in your area that is also interested. So often there's so many young people who come up to me and say, oh, like, you know, there's no one in my area who's actually doing anything about who can I reach out to? Where can I go? You just have to dig deeper. There's always someone who's equally as worried about the climate crisis, who just wants someone else to work with, to organize and to branch out to your local community. That's the most important thing. Thanks, Naga. And Mark? Yeah, it's similar. I mean, I, I would add perhaps I think there's value in sort of taking time to sort of educate yourself, whether it's attending a course like the sort of climate reality ones or or doing something online. Um, we often reluctant as activists thinking that other people know more than we do, but actually it doesn't take much to sort of really get the grips of the key issues of the problem. So I think that's one. And like my second one would be just to echo what others have said about joining a group. Sometimes it just it just being among other people who get it. It, it can, whether you, and I don't disagree with the point about having to take action, but linking back to the previous question about mental well-being, it's just sometimes being with a group of other people who get it that you're not having to again fight with them or convince them, and they're just on the same side as you can be. Just great for both, you know, linking up, doing things, um, but also for your mental health as well. Absolutely, thanks, Mark. And finally, my Rose. Um, I think all the main points have been covered, but I'd like to add that um, with big, very difficult situations like this, I think it's very easy to sort of stew in the misery of the whole situation. It can feel very uh, impossible almost, I suppose. Um, and I guess my advice is not to linger in that feeling because all that's gonna do is hold you back from doing uh, the best work that you could do to try and help in the situation. Um, and yeah, sorry, that's it. Thank you very much, <laughs> right. 
Thank you everyone so far. So questions from the audience, and there are a few. Um, so first one is from Karen, and this is to, to everyone on the panel. How do we grow alliances and connections between different environmental groups and social justice groups as tackling poverty is deeply intertwined with tackling climate breakdown and biodiversity loss? So um, yeah, a great question there. And I'm looking for, for volunteers to take that one. Oh, no, girl, I think you just got it. I oh, know you weren't putting your hand up. Apologies. <laughs> I'll go to Mark then, I saw. I, I think actually is is the one one of the great things about the Green New Deal is is it does do that. I, I think it, it, it is one of the areas that understands that actually linking the solutions to uh, the climate crisis are also beneficial to addressing the uh, social equity crisis. I mean, you know, and, and again, Noga touched this right up front in terms of her in, introduction is the, the fact that those people who will suffer most from climate are also those who are probably already suffering from inequality and racial injustice and things of that nature. So I think there's an awful lot within the Green New Deal and the way that the campaign is structured that, that addresses those. Um, but also I'm aware that increasingly we're finding that campaign groups, climate action networks and climate coalitions are increasingly starting to bring in other organizations into their fold um, for that exact reason, that, that, that many other organizations are recognizing this sort of intersectionality between solving the social crisis issues. Um, and even at a practical level, you know, linking up groups to understand what sort of grants may be available for sort of warmer homes or those sorts of things, you know, a very immediate practical level so I think there are opportunities to do it either aligned with a campaign like the Green New Deal um, or through joining up with other groups and encouraging them to sort of widen their network. Absolutely thanks Mark did you want to add anything there Maya Rose? Um, yeah I think Mark covered that very well um, yeah actually no Mark just covered that very well <laughs> sorry. That's all right, lovely. In the interest of time, so great question here from Richard, which is quite open. Richard's question is, what question would the panelists ask government? So thinking about uh, the Green Deal, thinking about the commitments we've talked about. If you could ask one question to government, or if you already have, um, what would it be? Uh, mm -hmm. My rose was that hand was it Did yeah I see? sorry thank you over to you um i think for me it would be asking uh high level politicians what it would take for them to stop thinking about politics and the future of the country in five-year bouts um because i think for me in the uk that's been one of the biggest um difficulties one of the biggest flaws in terms of trying to build a better future um, where because of the way that the system works, people are never thinking about uh, 20, 30 years time. They're thinking about the next five years and how they can make sure that they win the next election and stay in power. Um, and I would love to know at what point their, prior their priorities would shift and it would be about the good of the planet, the good of the people that they're supposed to represent. Um, but yeah, sorry, yeah. That's lovely. Thank you, Myra Rose. So I'm just firing through. So a great question here from Joe. What do the panelists think will be the most difficult industry or sector to decarbonize? And what will be the sticking points um, in their opinion? So who would like to take that one? It's a tough question. Anna, thank you very much. I can try. Um, again, I'm not an expert, but but there are some sort of heavy industries, you know, sort of steel production and things like that, that do need massive amounts of heat. Um, and so they, those will be pretty difficult to, A, completely get rid of, because we're still going to need some of those products, but they will be quite difficult to decarbonize. It's not impossible. And, and I think there's a sort of, there's a, a very sort of um, careful road to be trodden about how we, how much we actually need those products and then making sure that you're only using fossil fuels when you absolutely have to, and there's no other choice. I think, mm. I think there's, there's some sort of quite difficult um, decisions coming down the line about how we decarbonize or, or minimize the amount of carbon in some of those some of those industries. But Mark probably knows more than I do about that. He's, he's raising his hand, which is good. <laughs> 
Mark, thanks. Um, yes, I was going to offer a very highly technical answer. Just, I mean, a couple of opinions though on it. I think one, one of the ones is those that can't naturally just switch to renewable energy. So I'm thinking agriculture and sort of the move to regenerative farming and regeneration generally, um, because that links in again to the fact that, you know, there's a concentration of land ownership, um, which is a big issue in terms of how you, you take that forward. So the simple answer to the question is, I think agriculture and land use may may well prove to be the most difficult one but there's an interesting one as well which um lots of environmentalists have talked about the benefits of um staycations and reducing travel abroad and and those good things and and this year has forced us to see what that might look like and as somebody who lives in a coastal town and um, you guys down in cornwall may have seen this as well um it's been hell um, I mean, it, it really isn't sort of some kind of wonderful green nirvana where everybody stayed home and enjoyed the beautiful um, English countryside and responsibly and, and ethically well, because it's, you know, we have forced hundreds of thousands of people to jam up our roads um, and, um, and, and, and cause immeasurable dam damage as well to both, the, you know, the coast and, and a number of areas. So I think that that one is a real challenge is to, you know, how do, how do we actually really look at look at tra uh, travel um, and tourism as as one area and again because you know if we were to suddenly stop foreign travel then that is a, again it becomes an economic issue for lots of regions around the world who rely on tourism so i think that's one we really haven't grappled with very well yet yeah thank you mark um, i'm minded to agree on the transport point particularly if you think we're going to electrify um, heat as well we're going to electrify transport that's a lot to achieve particularly with with battery infrastructure as well, which the UK so desperately needs. Sorry, very quickly, um, and anyone on the Eden team, if you're going to cut me off, please shout now. But I think we've got time for, for one or two more, more questions. Uh, good question here from Brenda. What do the panelists think about the inclusion of nuclear power in uh, the Prime Minister's 10 point plan? Anyone fancy a go at that one? Mark, thank you. If, if no, 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 I mean, I, my only view would be is I, I, I reference some earlier points is firstly, the the um, the work that the Centre for Alternative Technology has shown that actually it is physically possible to power ourselves with renewable energy without nuclear. So I think there's 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 not a need would be the first challenge. And the second thing was it's just so expensive. So, again, putting aside all of the risks, which we could talk about for an hour, um, you know, it's, it's just getting increasingly expensive. And we've passed, I think, now the tipping point where renewable energy and technology is actually cheaper and easier to deploy than nuclear. So um, I think, you know, and the final point really would be when you invest in infrastructure, as we've talked about again earlier, is that that tends to have a, a shelf life of a long time, 25 to 30 years. So we should really be investing now in what the technology we want to have in 25 to 30 years, which is renewables. So every pound you invest in nuclear energy and subsidising a really expensive um, energy is being diverted from the energy that will actually get us out of this crisis. So I just don't think there's a need for it. Too expensive, too dangerous, and we actually don't need it. Thank you, Mark, for that answer. Oh, I'm afraid everyone, we're, we're almost out of time. In fact, we probably are, um, which is a shame because I'd love to continue. Um, I, before I wrap things up, I just wanted to, to, to give the opportunity to the rest of the panel if there's any final thoughts they'd like to share. If not, that, that's also absolutely fine. Um, Sorry, I'm going to be really rude and interrupt. I'm autistic and I'm quite offended because my question hasn't been answered and I'm very, very, very simple individual grassroots living in White City near an A40, very polluted. I just ask simply, is me trying to do green corridors across the centre of, of an estate, council estate, going to make any difference to the pollution that's off the road quite near us? Apologies for that one. Sorry, there's just so many questions to go through. So I'm, I'm sorry we've missed that one. Uh, and again, looking to the rest of my Eden team, if any questions remain unanswered, hopefully there's an opportunity to, to answer them separately by, by text, um, if the panelists would be happy to do that after the session. Um, but the question is, so in the White City, um, is greening corridors going to, going to have an impact for, um, for the local area in terms of better air quality and, and better environmental quality? Is, is that the question, sorry? Yes, more or less. Um, I've already done a community garden, which is a wildlife one, but we're trying to green more space. 
I, th I think probably the answer is yes, absolutely. And, and, and why wouldn't it? And I think that's another hopefully unintended consequence, but a really big benefit of um, moving away to uh, more staycations and perhaps the local sustainable transport is that the, the impact on air quality is, is going to be um, significantly improved. So I, I would hope yes. Um, is there any other thoughts from that from, uh, from the panel at all? I mean, I'm um, actually from White City, like that's where I lived for the last 10 years. So yeah, I can't think of anything better than to decrease the massive amounts of pollution that we have to breathe in there. Um, I think it sounds like a great initiative. I mean, you can never go wrong with organising something in your local community. There's no, there's really no downside to it. Great. Thank you, Naga. That's really great. Well, thank you to everybody um, and huge thanks to, um, to our panellists. I'm sure if we're all in the room together, they'll be getting a huge round of applause. Um, but I'd just like to thank Anna, Noga, Mark and Myra. So, oh, you are getting a round of applause. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, an hour um, isn't that long, is it, after all? So, so thanks so much for your time. I think for me, just some of the, the three key takeaways I've got, which, which I'm going to take forwards, is that what's COVID COVID has proven is that we can change, we can adapt and we can move quite quickly. Um, really great point for Maya Rose is that we're not perfect, we're, we're doing all we can, but you know, there is still this element of, of never being perfect and you shouldn't beat yourself up and try and think that you could be. And certainly that um, patronizing the youth is absolutely not the way to go, we're, we're well beyond that. And then finally, um, some of the points that, that Mark has raised is that we're much better and we're much stronger together just by being part of something, part of a group, part of a movement, and some of the points that, that Noga raised as well, is hugely important, um, both in terms of sharing ideas, but also for your sanity and, and, and mental well-being as well. So those are really the, the key points for me. And, and thank you to, to everyone for joining. Um, I thought that was a really great session. Um, just very quickly, um, we do have a feedback form, um, and there's a, there's a survey monkey which my colleague Hannah has put in, the chat box as well. Um, and also if you really enjoyed your experience for Eden Project and you would like to donate to the wonderful Eden Project charity that there is a link in there um, as well, which is justgiving.com uh, forward slash campaign forward slash festival of discovery. Um, and there's lots more on the festival of discovery website for, for you to look at many, many more sessions this afternoon. So thanks so much for your time. We hope to see you again. Um, and thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh -huh.